1964, I was stationed in Thule, Greenland. That may be of where all this, this uh, arose. I don't, I don't know. But I had no awareness of the story of Thule, Greenland. It it's, was then and is now an Air Force base in the northwestern corner of that country. There are some 60,000 people that live in a place that's the size, three times the size of Texas. Thule Greenland is the upper left-hand corner. Uh, you see Kanak identified up there. In 1953, the people of this area, there were about 600 of them living in this wide expanse in the northwestern corner. They call themselves Inuguits, I-N-U-G-H-U-I-T. And they lived up in this part of uh, that country. And they were nomadic in nature. They hunted all over these lands in this segment up here. You see Kanak. Kanak is the place to which these people were relocated in 1953, uh, coercively by the United States and Denmark. You may know that Greenland is still a protectorate of, uh, of Denmark. They have recently voted 75% in favor of becoming totally independent of them. This is where I was stationed 64. This is the base as it pretty much looks today. The center of all that nomadic activity was a place the Greenlanders called, the Inuits called, Umanak. It was at the base of the mountain in the last slide. These people were given three or four days to move from that location. Although they were nomadic in nature, they returned generally to that specific area because it had specific ancestral significance to them. Many of their ancestors were buried there. There was a trading post that had been established in the early part of the last century there. That's where they came every six or nine or 12 months. They followed their animals, uh, their prey, about that wide expanse. When the United States negotiated with the Denmark to put their base there, the Inuit people were no longer permitted to hunt within, I don't know exactly what the radius is, but a large expanse of that land around Thule, Greenland. And they were relocated to this little village that you saw a minute ago, Kanak. It didn't exist at the time. Um, I, a year ago, a gentleman by the name of Akaluk Ling visited Dartmouth College, and I had read Akaluk's book. It's called Let Them Return. I believe I've got it over on the table over here. And he is their most important advocate in the world. He is an Inuit himself. He's from southwestern Greenland. He's been the uh, president of something called the, Inter, uh, the Inuit Circumpolar Council. All the Inuit people across the top of the globe have formed a confederacy that gives them some clout in international bodies. And Akaluk has been the president of that body, and he's also a member of the Greenland Parliament. And he is very, very invested in these people's right to return to this area. They called us for a meeting and told us that they had made a decision that we had to move. It gave us a lot of worries because they gave us only four days to move. I had old parents, and I also had to think of taking care of them. For 50 years, the Tuli population has been struggling to make the Danish state admit that Denmark and the USA had made an injustice to a whole population when the settlers were forced away from their country. Now the Danish Supreme Court must decide on the question. At the same time, the USA are thinking of making the Tula Air Base into a cornerstone of the Star Wars project. Thanks, Mary Beth. So I had this great opportunity to go up to Greenland and, and meet with some of these people and interview some of the and interview some of the first person victims of the displacement. In 1968, a B-52 flying as they routinely did over Greenland, I was trying to make a forced landing at Thule and uh, crashed on the ice outside, maybe 12 miles away from Thule Air Base. It was carrying four nuclear weapons on board. And one of those has never been found. And that's been information that has been known since, I believe, since about the time of the accident. And it just, and I don't know, somehow or other it's been repressed and suppressed. Just recently, you may have seen, there were some 
little flap about it as there was a BBC film crew that happened to be up at Canock when I was there who was pursuing this story. And they've reported it once again in the British press. I don't think they've ever got any follow-up over here. But there is evidence that the Danish people who were involved in the cleanup operation of that were affected by radioactive poisoning. There were never any tests that I've been able to determine conducted on the 13 Inuits who helped with the cleanup operation. I had the opportunity to interview, among others, a gentleman who had been one of those 13 people. Uh, it happened in 1968, so you can appreciate that they must have been at least 20 years old or thereabouts to have been involved in the cleanup. So this guy happened to be my age, he's 67, and he reported to me and gave me the names of all of the 13 Inuits who had been involved, 11 of which are dead. So that, <clears throat> that sends up a red flag, not necessarily an absolute um, affirmation that these people died due to their exposure, but it certainly makes me curious about it, and uh, therefore I'm anxious to get back to Canuck to see what I can dig up with regards to that. The woman that I'm about to show you uh, is named Louise Kuwakitsak, and she, as you will hear, was among those who, although she will share with you that she wasn't living at Kanak on those, I mean, I'm sorry, at what they, the place they called Umanak, the place right next to Thule Air Base. She and her husband were not actually living there then, but they were among those hunters who just coincidentally were coming back to Umanak. They had been away for about nine months, I believe, uh, to an area they call Sarapaluk, hunting, and uh, they met, as she will report, these people who had just been removed from their lands. Um, it hasn't been edited, I apologize for that. She goes on to talk about how life, yes, it was more difficult in Canuck for them, as was corroborated by other interviews I had, primarily because uh, they had settled on that particular area around what they called Umanok because it was the best hunting grounds. The bay that they were located in, um, Americans called North Star Bay, had lots of seals and lots of narwhal, narwhals and lots of, lots of uh, walruses in it. Umanok was, the village, their village was right in this area, just a, a mile or so from the base itself. And this was a, a sacred mountain. We call it uh, Dundas. Uh, and they hunted all across this expanse here. I just got an email from Akaluk Ling, the gentleman I mentioned to you earlier as being a member of their parliament. Um, my interpreter was a young man by the name of Masenwak Kuwakitsak, same last name as Louise. Masenwak is about, a, he's a 30 year old man. He's been educated in Copenhagen. You heard his English, it's quite good. And his father is Usakak Kuwakitsak. His father is the son of one of the leaders of the people at the time they were displaced. And Usakak is the founder, this is my interpreter's father, is the founder of their group called Hingatak 53. 53 being the year that they were displaced. And Hingatak meaning the outcasts. And this confederacy of Inuit people are still seeking restitution from Denmark and trying to get returned to uh, to their lands to once again hunt in that area. I asked myself, you know, is there a place on earth that is so pristine, so remote, so sacred that it's invulnerable to the US military? And I asked myself if it matters that 
The people of the Marshall Islands were knowingly irradiated. <clears throat> Does it matter that the Inuits may perish? Does it matter that the Chagossians may not be permitted to go back to their lands? One of the Brum is a member of the Marshall Island Congress. And in 2005, before the United Nations, at a nonproliferation treaty uh, conference, he said, a relatively small number of world leaders and decision makers do not have the right to destroy the well-being and livelihood of any society, whether large or small, in the name of global security. 